Okay, welcome. It is time to dive into this very complex inquiry around what is going on in Ukraine. So I've set myself up here with my laptop. There's a lot of notes to go through. And if you haven't had the opportunity to watch the video where I introduced this whole project, I recommend that you do that now. Particularly because of how contentious this situation has become so quickly. I see again how we are becoming polarized and uh, I'm tired of polarization. There is nothing more polarizing than a war. And since this is a very complicated situation, if you're on either side of the battle, so to speak, you will find things in, well, history and in the, the, the truthful telling of this story that can be offensive. And you, ha you have to live with that because I'm here to really find out what is going on. And I will claim, you know, no expertise here. I'm not a historian. I haven't been to Ukraine. I have been to the Soviet, but I haven't been back to Russia after it stopped being the Soviet. So this is not a region of the world that I have taken that much interest in up until just recently. And now this Pandora's box is opening up and I'm seeing how much of world history is connected to this territory. It's a tragedy. When one sovereign country attacks another, invades another, and what is going on is wrong. And I want to bring the nuance. And if you're not interested in nuance, then skip this video series. So let's dive into this. I'm going to start in the 9th century uh, when um, the Kievan Rus was founded. So interestingly, Rus, I didn't know this before I started digging into it, is a stem that is connected to a Finnish word, Ruotsi, that is the name for Sweden. I don't know if that is a contemporary Finnish word or not, but uh, Rus stems from that. And so there is this very strong connection between the Old Norse people and uh, Kiev and Rus. In um, Old Norse, the region was called Gardariki. And in addition to these Swedes, these Norse people, you had Slavs and other people living there as well. So it was a bit of a melting pot. So this region um, was then founded by the Rurik dynasty, founded by the Varangian prince Rurik. This Kievan Rus would be dissolved in the 16th century when the Tsardom of Russia emerged in 1547. And Tsar is actually a Slavic word or interpretation of the word Caesar, so it's essentially a kind of a Russian emperor. The Tsardom of Russia gave way to the Russian Empire after a victory over the Swedish Empire in 1721 in the Great Northern War. The Swedish Empire was very powerful back then, owned parts of Norway, Finland, the Baltic states, some small satellite regions across the water in the Polish-German territories, and they wanted to claim uh, Russia. And uh, while well, they, uh, they didn't succeed, and after their failed conquest, the Tsardom of Russia became the Russian Empire. So now the Tsar was you know, truly an emperor. And in this time period, we see a lot of Russification of the Ukraine. This, this word Russification describes the process in which Russia is trying to uh, push their culture, their language, their values onto another country. So let's, let's look at that uh, briefly here. The Russification of Ukraine. A set of policies or processes encouraging non-Russians to adopt the Russian language and culture and thus increasing Russian political dominion or domination in Ukraine and other U Eastern European countries. The rapid expansion of Muscovy and then of the Russian Empire was connected with the Russification of the indigenous peoples of Eastern Europe and Northern and Central Asia. 
The smaller nations or tribes were assimilated by the Russians, and the most ambitious and talented elements of various nationalities were drawn to the administrative, industrial and cultural centers of the empire and became Russified. Also Russified were many scholars and specialists from Western Europe who made their careers in Russia. Some figures of Balkan and even Polish and Galician origin looked toward a powerful Russia for protection against Turkey or Germany and became Russified. We can further read here that Ukrainian autonomy was gradually restricted and finally abolished. In 1720, it was forbidden to print books in Ukrainian, and Ukrainian redactions of church Slavonic books had to be checked against Russian redactions to avoid any discrepancies. This is from a site called the Internet Encyclopedia of Ukraine. So clearly, this is a very strong domination of Ukraine from Moscow. And probably not super popular, right, in Ukraine. And then you have the Russian Empire for a good 200 years. 1917 is the year it dissolves. And what happens is that the Russian Empire and the Tsar the autocratic Tsar is becoming weakened by his involvement in World War I. There's a lot of casualties and it's very unpopular that he's waging this war and um, he's encouraged to step down in order to ensure stability and to give it, uh, to give the governance over Russia to an interim government. And so for, for about six months there until October, they are governing Russia and um, then the Bolsheviks come and basically take them out. And so so the, the fall of the Tsar uh, or the Russian Empire is the February, February Revolution of 1917 and then you have the October Revolution which is the fall of the interim government and you get the Bolsheviks taking control. But not everyone agrees with this revolution and so you get the Russian Civil War where you have the Red Army of the Bolsheviks against an alliance of various more disparate forces and the White Army, capitalists being one of the um, influences there. And then that is waged until 1923 when the Red Army is victorious. The Soviet Union is formed in 1922. And within this union, there are 15 republics with Russia being the most powerful and then Ukraine being the second most powerful. And so obviously being the two at the top, there's going to be tension. We now move on to the Kulaks. Uh, this, is, this is a terrible tragedy and absolutely horrifying what the, what the Soviets did. Let's see here the Encyclopedia Britannica. Kulak in Russian and Soviet history is a wealthy or prosperous peasant generally characterized as one who owned a relatively large farm and several head of cattle and horses and who was financially capable of employing hired labor and leasing land. Before the Russian Revolution of 1917, the Kulaks were major figures in the peasant villages. They often lent money, provided mortgages, and played central roles in the villages, social and administrative affairs. So obviously these are a, a force within Ukraine. I don't know why it doesn't say that it's within Ukraine here, but it is. And so they are a threat to the Soviet Union. And so there's a little bit of a back and forth. And then eventually the Soviet Union starts towards the end of the 1920s to impose these grotesque taxation. Uh, systems whereby the, the kulaks are not able to, to keep up with the demands. Not even a good harvest will yield enough of a harvest for the Soviets to be happy. And so, well, now they're in trouble because you have a, a completely draconian dictatorial power ruling over them and they're not able to keep up with the demands. And this leads to them being imprisoned and sent off to, to work camps in Siberia. And so all of these, the elite of the farmers, the most competent farmers of Ukraine are killed off essentially. And then that leaves Ukraine with a problem is that they cannot produce enough food. And so you get the 
you get the tragedy of the Holodomor in 1932 and 33, where about, well, the, the historians are throwing out very disparate numbers here, but let's say around 5 million people die of a, a deliberate famine. And so there's some level of contention here, if you can actually call it a genocide or not. But in Ukraine, it's clearly considered to be a genocide of 5 million people. Those are 5 million people. That is pretty intense. That is absolutely atrocious. Like one of the worst crimes in humanity. You know, it was absolutely terrible. So, <clears throat> so that's apparently at this point, Lenin has taken over or Stalin has taken over from Lenin as the leader of the Bolsheviks. And some argue that this Holodomor was designed in order to crush any Ukrainian independence movement because they wanted to be independent. Okay, so we have now arrived in World War II. And uh, let's go to June 22nd of 1941 and Operation Barbarossa. So this allegedly is the biggest military operation in the history of the world. And the Nazis were aiming to capture St. Petersburg, Moscow and Kiev. And uh, when World War II broke out, based on all of this oppression and all of the things that had been done to the Ukraine from the side of Russia, even though they were in the Soviet Union, there was a a strong independence movement there. They, they wanted to be free. And so a strong presence of Ukrainian nationalists had emerged. And um, well, they were essentially fascists and they were formed in 1929, an organization of the Ukrainian nationalists. The OUN was formed in 1929 and split up in 1940 when the M branch and the B branch of the OUN formed, where the M branch was a little bit more moderate, more conservative, and the B branch was uh, radicalized, had this red and black flag that has since become associated with Ukrainian nationalism, and um, was led by Stepan Bandera, who favored a very revolutionary approach. So here is what Wikipedia says. The ideology of the OUN is described as similar to it Italian fascism. The OUN sought to infiltrate legal political parties, universities and other political structures and institutions. The OUN strategies to achieve Ukrainian independence include violence and terrorism against perceived foreign and domestic enemies, particularly Poland, Czechoslovakia, the Kingdom of Romania and the Soviet Union. Well, it sounds a lot like what the R Russians might have done to Ukraine in the efforts to Russify Ukraine. And so you have a back and forth here. But the surprising thing is that many of them, they welcome the Nazis as liberators because they're done with the Russians and they want to be free from the Russians. And since there is already this strong kernel of fascism there, there is now a collaboration that begins. And so, among other things, what this leads to is that in 1943, the um, SS Galician Division forms, and it's full of Ukrainians, 80,000 of them, in fact, Slavs. And the, the Germans actually, <laughs> you know, uh, they had to bite, a, bite their own bullet of pride here. They actually saw the Slavs as Untermensch, and they started to suffer big casualties. And so they had to lower their thresholds or their purity demands or whatever you would call it so that they could have more people fighting for them. And so the, these 80,000 Ukrainians in the SS Galician division was a volunteer branch of the armies of the Third Reich. And uh, they became notorious for their extreme cruelty against the Polish, among other things. And between the OUN militia here, the SS Galician division, 
It's estimated that as many as 150 to 200,000 Jews could have been killed. Uh, you know, it boggles the mind the level of tragedy that has uh, taken place in this, in this country. So Stepan Bandera, as the nationalist that he is, he proclaims an independent Ukraine in 1941, which leads to him being imprisoned by the Nazis. Because even though there was a level of collaboration between them here, the Nazis didn't want that level of uppity behavior, you know, that was a little bit too independent for them. And uh, they sent him off to concentration camps for large parts of the war. Um, in, uh, let's see, we have another terrible, terrible tragedy taking place in um, 1941. It's called the, the Babi Yar, or the Babin Yar, where inside of uh, Kiev, uh, the Jews are, are commanded to, to come and present themselves, and they are subsequently killed. So there's 30, 33,771 Jews that are murdered. Let's see here. The massacre was the largest mass murder under the auspices of the Nazi regime and its collaborators during its campaign against the Soviet Union. And it has been called the largest single massacre in the history of the Holocaust to that particular date. It is only surpassed overall by the later nine 1941 Odessa massacre of more than 50,000 Jews in October 1941, committed by German and Romanian troops. So both of these massacres happening inside of the borders of Ukraine, it's just, it's just horrific. Let's see. And this is strange. I'm going to jump to more present times for a moment. This is strange how this has actually become these movements, these people have become popular. Here we can read in Jewish World or Ynet News. Um, Ukraine's new heroes, anti-Semites and murderers of Jews. Stepan Bandera collaborated with the Nazis. Simon Petura is linked to the massacre of as many as 100,000 Jews and even Rohach was the editor of an anti-Semitic newspaper, yet the three of them are commemorated in Ukraine's city squares and streets. This is morally unacceptable, a local Jewish leader says, accusing the government of rewriting history and denying the Holocaust. So what is happening here exactly? There is a weird dynamic playing out between Jews and Nazis in Ukraine. I don't understand it. I don't even understand what is happening there today with the Jewish president and these forces still being strong inside of Ukraine. I don't get it. It's very strange. But we will get to that in the next video. I'm going to cover now the role of the CIA. After the World War was won, the Nazis were conquered, the United States initiated Operation Paperclip. So here we can read... Operation Paperclip was a secret United States intelligence program in which more than 1,600 Nazi German scientists, engineers and technicians were taken from former Nazi Germany to the US for government employment after the end of World War II in Europe between 1945 and 59. So apparently many of the Nazis, they, you know, they were trialed in the Nuremberg trials and executed many of them. But many of the Nazis of Ukraine um, were not. And this is according to Doug Valentine. And so what happened then was that you had a man, a Nazi, who had been working on the Eastern Front, basically to fight the, the, the Soviet Union. His name was Reinhard Gellin. And he, yeah, he was a chief of the FHO under the Nazis. And this was an intelligence operation on the Eastern Front. And then he was taken over to the United States, as so many other Nazis were, and he started to work for the CIA, was trained by the CIA, 
and then he was told to well activate his network inside of Ukraine. For the next several decades, the CIA, through these fascist or ultranationalist or sometimes even Nazi networks, have been working to undermine Russian influence on Ukraine. And according to Doug Valentine, who is, among other things, um, famous for the book The CIA as Organized Crime, he claims that the politicians opposed to the interests of America have routinely been put on hit lists and then targeted by the networks in Ukraine. Businessmen and the military people and the politicians that support the Americans benefit and those who don't are put on hit lists and they're targeted. And, and that's basically the history and the summary of what's going on in the Ukraine. And the, the CIA through its agent operations, which have been in place for 70 years, is at the vanguard of that, of that uh, operation. And so this, this is kind of mind boggling because what you have here is this subculture that is quite powerful of fascists, ultranationalists, even Nazis, that is actually funded and, and to a large extent um, governed by the CIA. Isn't that wild? It's just super wild. So let's look now at NATO and the post-war period. So NATO forms in 1949, the North Atlantic Treaty um, Organization. And uh, it is a defensive alliance against any provocations or attacks from the Soviet Union. Initially also Germany, though I think that soon became less relevant. And then when uh, West Germany joins NATO in 1955, the Warsaw Pact is established. Uh, in this, this period uh, in, in the Soviet Union, there's quite a bit happening. Now, Stalin is no longer in power as of 1954, when Nikita Khrushchev comes into power as the first secretary of the Communist Party. And uh, he came to liberalize the Union quite a bit. And in 1954, he um, actually, being a Ukrainian himself, he essentially handed over Crimea to Ukraine. And when it was the Soviet Union, maybe that didn't seem as important, but once the Soviet Union fell, it was a different matter altogether, I imagine. So um, Mikhail Gorbachev and the perestroika move, uh, moves he made was in 1980s. It was a set of politics uh, designed to liberalize uh, the Soviet Union is essentially making it more friendly towards uh, the West and to the Western way of being and governing. And that led then to the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. And I remember this really well. I even had one of these uh, stones from the Berlin Wall that I had on the shelf in my, in my bedroom. So I wasn't there personally when it happened, but um, I remember it well, 1989, right? And, um, and then things were different. Things were very different all of a sudden. We imagined that a whole new world was about to open up. A world of peace and prosperity and was going to be way better. And I would say that things were pretty good back then. And so much of my life I've lived in this period, right? I was born in 1978. I've been very privileged to live in this period. Um, so things start moving in Ukraine when the Soviet Union falls. Uh, it enables uh, the nationalist forces in Ukraine to, to grow stronger. And the people's movement of Ukraine form as a result of this fall. And then Ule Tianibok, Ule Tianibok. He, um, he was a member of the People's Movement of Ukraine. And in 1995, he forms Svoboda, which is a ultra-nationalist party. So this is a contentious claim, but the Russian side claims that 30 years ago, the US Secretary of State, James Baker, promised the whole world, or at least Russia, that 
if Mikhail Gorbachev agreed to unite Germany, then NATO will not move one inch to the east. And then the United States side claims that that isn't exactly what happened. But in the mind of Russians, and at least Vladimir Putin, this is a promise that was broken. Uh, Ukraine also gave away their nuclear weapons. In order to give them away in the 1994 Budapest Memorandum, Russia agreed to protect Ukrainian sovereignty and to protect Ukraine, essentially, which is a promise that obviously has been broken. The Orange Revolution was a series of protests and political events that took place in Ukraine from late November 2004 to January 2005, in the immediate aftermath of the runoff vote of the 2004 Ukrainian presidential election, which was claimed to be marred by massive corruption, voter intimidation and electoral fraud. Kiev, the Ukrainian capital, was a focal point of the movement's campaign of civil resistance, with thousands of protesters demonstrating daily. Nationwide, the revolution was highlighted by a series of acts of civil disobedience, sit-ins and general strikes organized by the opposition movement. The protests were prompted by reports from several domestic and foreign election monitors, as well as the widespread public perception that the results of the runoff vote of 21st of November 2004 between leading candidates Viktor Yushchenko and Viktor Yanukovych were rigged by the authorities in favor of the latter. The nationwide protests succeeded when the results of the original runoff were annulled and a revote was ordered by Ukraine's Supreme Court for 26th of December 2004. Under intense scrutiny by domestic and international observers, the second runoff was declared to be free and fair. The final results showed a clear victory for Yushchenko, who received about 52% of the vote, compared to Yanukovych's 45%. Yushchenko was declared the official winner, and with his inauguration on the 23rd of January 2005 in Kyiv, the Orange Revolution had ended. Now, you may remember that Yushchenko became a victim of a Novichok uh, poison incident. And of course, we have just assumed that this was ordered by Putin. The weird thing is that this hero of the people of the Orange Revolution, Yushchenko, uh, he afforded the ultranationalist Stepan Bandera, the hero of Ukraine medal. Uh, this was later retracted by Yanukovych, but again, it's, it's strange. This is essentially a Nazi and this hero of democracy that was beloved by the West is giving him a hero of Ukraine medal. Again, I, I, I don't get it. Like, it doesn't make sense to me. This is a mind bender, man. Just wild, the level of complexity here. And in the next video, I'm going to be covering what happened starting in late 2013 and up until today. We will, of course, then be looking at the Euromaidan revolution and um, the kind of impact of these ongoing ultranationalist uh, influences in Ukraine. There is a lot of emphasis on how unimportant they are now in, in the, the information warfare between Russia and the West. And let's figure out if they truly are fairly insignificant or if they actually have quite a bit of influence. I have some more research to do there, but I already have some, some idea. So yeah, contentious perhaps this, but this is the best information I could find. And if there's anything that you know that is uh, wrong in what I've said, then please share that below. And uh, let's figure out what is really going on here uh, together. So this has been long, but you know, there was a lot of territory to cover and I appreciate you for being here and being part of this. And um, I look forward to seeing you again in the next video.